hearing a lot of the astronomy and um, right. so that's how I got to see a lot of All right, and we should be live here on YouTube. Give me a quick second and uh, make sure that we are porting over here. All right, if you guys are uh, joining in this uh, live stream, just want to say welcome to the jungle. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, we got some great folks filtering in here already, Mark, which is awesome. Um, guys, do me a solid. If you can put in the YouTube chat, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and you can see me. Uh, admittedly, I'm not a, a tech guru, so I hope that the uh, live stream is coming through and uh, you guys can give me an all clear on the audio and the video. Uh, super excited about today's live stream. We've got uh, none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Mark Bradley, founder of LMN, going to be sharing with us. Uh, a little bit of a, a sneak peek, a behind the scenes and under the hood look at how we're running our lawn and landscape company and our budget and our software that we've recently graduated to uh, to help us grow our Brian's Lawn Maintenance Company. Uh, so I have another little bit of a intro and some other stuff I want to share. But before uh, I just kind of steamroll here, you guys know how I go. I uh, talk a little bit more than I probably should. I want to take a quick minute and uh, introduce our guest of honor, Mr. Mark Bradley. How are you doing today, brother? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Glad absolutely. How's everything going? Uh, are you back in Canada? I know you've been uh, on tour. You did, uh, what, 20 or 30 cities in the last three months. You've been living out of a suitcase. So what's uh, what's going on with you, brother? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just uh, just wrapped up, actually. Yeah, we did uh, 24 cities. Uh, so it was a back-to-back -back adventure, lots of, uh, lots of travel. So I was uh, only home about uh, 15, 16 days, I think, since October 3rd, uh, between all the trade shows and events and uh, mastermind sessions. It's been, uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. Yeah. Uh, is that the probably the biggest um, kind of season for you guys with a lot of folks looking at software? And I know you've been on tour with your masterminds. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that for a quick minute. But probably um, like myself, a lot of folks are looking to maybe upgrade or graduate software or uh, make a change in their company. So um, again, what's the last uh, three months look like? You've been probably have a, a finger on the industry and a pulse on the industry uh, as good as anybody I would know. So what uh, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been, uh, I think everybody's actually feeling pretty optimistic. I know last fall people were sort of wondering, you know, what the economy would do. But uh, in general, it seems like everybody's got a nice full pipeline, lots of work uh, lined up for this year. So a lot of positivity out there, which is good. Certainly not the the COVID years where we were couldn't answer the phone fast enough. That's for sure. But uh, I think everybody's uh, feeling good. And one one thing I really notice a lot of contractors saying is that by not being maybe quite as busy as they were a few years back, they're just finding more uh, quality in the jobs, putting more effort into training the staff and and maintaining. Um, little bit more efficient way of doing things and getting a little bit more focused and you know at the end of the day sales may not be growing quite as fast but profits often grow faster when things stabilize a little bit and, and for that reason I always try to talk to people about really optimizing profit before looking to grow revenue because I think you know unfortunately there's a there's a big thirst for the top line revenue growth and that's not always the healthiest way to run a business. Yeah, I can uh, relate to that. Um, we have so much to get into today, and I'm really, really excited about kind of uh, piggybacking off of that statement you just made and, and so much more. Um, folks, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, let's let's kind of get into it here. A lot of you guys want to see an under the hood look of, uh, of LMN. Let me just preface it really quick. Um, you know, in sales, sometimes people will string you along for an hour and then they have a call to action. You know, Mark, uh, here, here's my hard here's my hard pitch and close that you normally do at the end. I'll just do it up front. And that way, nobody has to feel like they're going to get sold something sleazy or uh, get a pitch later. If you want to sign up with Element at the end of this, use code Brian, sign up, and rock and roll. If you don't, hopefully this is educational for you. And you can see, uh, as we grow our company to the higher revenue levels, what we're doing to grow and be profitable along the way. So I don't have a pitch here. Mark doesn't have a pitch here. 
uh, we really truthfully, transparently, genuinely just want to show how my company is looking to grow. And let me just even zoom out a little bit more on this whole conversation. The last 12 months have been a little bit of an interesting conversation for Liz and myself. It's been a little bit of a soul searching. Um, what do we want to do next? Uh, a lot of you guys know our story. The last five, six, seven years, we uh, have grown Brian's Law Maintenance from a 50, 60 grand a year side hustle, small business. Um, we kind of met some great people along the way and started to grow the company and revenue has been growing 50 to 100 grand, um, you know, year over year. But we've really been focused on the social media thing and, you know, grew a YouTube channel to a couple hundred thousand subscribers. We started on Instagram. We started a podcast. And I've been really focused on the social media business. Interestingly enough, we've continued to still grow Brian's Law Maintenance along the way. Um, and so what happened was Liz and I got to a point where we accomplished a lot of our dreams and goals. Uh, praise the Lord, you know, the last, um, you know, two years or so. So Liz and I, we said, well, we know uh, once you hit a goal, Mark, um, you don't want to be idle and you want to reset goals. And so Liz and I said, like, what's left? What do we want to do? And just, you know, just to be totally honest with you, I've been doing these shop tours. I've been able to network with some legends in the business. A lot of you guys have seen and heard those people. And it really inspired me and my wife, Liz, to really want to uh, grow a larger company and to see if we have what it takes. And so I also have hired some really great folks. Um, a lot of you guys know Mark and Rob and Ryan. And, you know, they're hungry, man. They're, they're ambitious. They want to make more money. Uh, they have, you know, young guys and young families. And I want to give them opportunity as well. So uh, no, you know, no hard picture on anything. But Liz and I are like, hey, we want to grow. Well, um, I had no intention of switching to LMN uh, up until about 90 days ago. I actually got invited to the mastermind with uh, Kayla and Brittany Allman. A lot of you guys know them on Instagram. And they said, hey, we're going to go check out Mark's mastermind. I know you're a big fan of Mark. Mark's shared twice at our live, uh, live event in November. And I said, yeah, I, I love listening to Mark. Like the dude is just, <laughs> I call you a wizard. I said, he's, uh, he's a legend in the industry. So I went to the mastermind. And I think this is a really important um, part of our story of why we are graduating to LMN. Because I get back from the... Uh, conference with Mark. It was a two day thing. And uh, we actually had the opportunity to take Mark to dinner. And, you know, Mark's just answering questions. And we're just hanging out. And I get back late night. And I don't know if it was that night or the next morning. Uh, Liz goes, hey, so what do you think about um, LMN? And I said, well, admittedly, I said, you know, yeah, the conference was cool. And, you know, Mark talked about LMN maybe 10% of the time. I said, but I'm really impressed with Mark. And she goes, well, tell me more. I said, I'm really impressed with his philosophy, his approach about business, his mission about helping the green industry grow. Um, he's just a passionate individual. And oh, yeah, by the way, he's got some great software. Um, and so to be totally honest with you, I wanted to, you know, link up my caboose to somebody who's been there, done that, who's willing to pay it forward. The guy's giving away a plethora of information and knowledge I mean, every single day he's doing these seminars and these summits and it's, it's just really, um, it's impressive. And so I told Liz, I said, I really want to grow a real company, a larger company. And I think Mark's the guy for us. And I think LMN software is what's going to help us graduate from our previous CRM and not only allow us to grow a larger company, but here's the big thing. Take the guesswork out of what we're trying to do. And admittedly, we've really um, stabilized a lot of our business the last four or five years, really the last two, but we're still guessing, you know, 10, 15, 20% of the time. And you guys can imagine if you run a smaller company, a little bit of guesswork, no big deal. As you grow a real company, million, two million, five million, 10 million, um, you can't afford to guess. You know, you don't want to be playing with people's lives. And so that's the whole narrative. I, I don't have... Um, Mark didn't call me up and say, hey, man, there's a great opportunity here to sell software. You want to get in with it? It wasn't like that. It wasn't. Um, I, I don't have any other narratives. I'm not really that creative. You know what I mean? I just told Liz, I said, I think Mark's the guy. Uh, I really have heard a bunch of great stuff about LMN. Uh, we've had the opportunity to onboard now. We probably got about 15 or 20 hours under our belt looking at the software. And I'm telling you, folks, not only am I impressed and I'm in love, and it's been everything I thought it would be. It's been that much more. And we're going to really break down a lot of that today. So 
Um, I just wanted to take five, 10 minutes here, share a little bit about my background, where Liz and I are at in business, um, what we're trying to do, where we're looking to go. Again, I'm not here to sell or convince you guys on switching to LMN. I just want to let you guys know, hey, maybe you have a, a small business and you're looking to grow, maybe LMN would be for you. If you have a medium-sized company like myself and you're real, looking to graduate as well, maybe LMN's a great you know, next um, step for you. Awesome. Hopefully we can share uh, about that today and maybe facilitate that uh, if you want to sign up. Fantastic. Maybe you guys already have a million, $2 million company and you already know you're ready to make a switch. You're ready to make a change and you just want to see a little bit more behind the scenes. Hopefully we can you know, piece together those last couple of puzzle pieces for you and uh, show you what the software is all about. So um, I just want to take a quick five minutes there, let you guys know where we're coming from. Again, no hard pitch, uh, but I know so many people have questions about the software and the platform. And so that's why I wanted to just take a quick minute this evening to get Mark on the live and see if uh, he'd be willing to share about LMN, our account, and just give you guys the most transparent look that we can uh, at the platform. Uh, so Mark, that's my background. Uh, that's my story. Uh, again, I don't want to really talk too much on this thing. You're a guest of honor, but uh, for anybody who doesn't know your background, uh, would you mind taking five or 10 minutes and just explaining, you know, you've been popping up everywhere, but um, a lot of folks actually don't know your background and don't know uh, your accolades, if you will. And, uh, you know, I know you're not one to read in your own press clippings, but you've had a very successful run in the green industry. So would you mind taking five or 10 minutes if you want to share your story? I think it'd be really helpful for folks that don't know your background. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and just to kind of layer on before doing that to what you were saying about this is not being a pitch. I think that's important. Um, if you do decide to sign up for Element, you can just take a trial. You don't have to like click and pay and we don't have contracts. Everything's monthly. There's no, uh, there's, there's never a contract with Element. It's pretty simple that way. And really like, even if you take a trial, feel, um, you know, free just to take a look with a trial. It doesn't have to lead to anything and you can take a trial anytime. If you ever need more time with your trial, we always give extensions. We're pretty relaxed that way. Um, we we definitely don't want to sell something uh, to somebody that they're not ready to use because that that's really not good for for anybody. We just we're pretty casual in our sales process. Um, second to that, we have uh, ongoing education, the Mastermind series, and that is available for non-customers. Um, one of my big personal missions is to, to create a thriving landscape industry. Um, the industry has given me an, an incredible um, gift in, in terms of a career and a career outcome. And so I've learned a lot along the way from a lot of people. And my mastermind series is really just me taking all of the amazing ideas and all of the gifts from people that kind of came before me here in the industry, kind of package it up. And I teach uh, the mastermind series in a few ways. I do a weekly 30-minute uh, uh, webinar where we cover a different topic every week that's kind of related to the time of year. And then we do the two-day in-session uh, mastermind meetings where we actually go through uh, sales process and people process. I always say that like your business is made up of two major things, the customers that you decide to work for, the problems you decide to solve for those customers really as one half. And then the other half is really um, the employees that you decide to hire and train and uh, work with every day to solve those problems. And so in the two day workshops, we really focus on optimizing the sales process so that you get the perfect customers and then the people process so that you've got the right people to work with every day in your company. So, um, regardless of if you ever buy software, take part in the education. That's all free. We don't charge for that. Uh, we do charge for the two day sessions, um, but the, the weekly webinar series is completely free. Hopefully you can join us for that. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I went to high school, did not want to go to college. I was kind of dead set against going to college. Uh, my parents weren't uh, paying for college. That was for sure. Uh, I, I grew up with, uh, you know, a average middle class type family, but we didn't have a lot of extra money and my parents weren't uh, um, able to just pay for college. And so as I got thinking about whether I wanted to go to college or do an apprenticeship or start a business, I was really leaning toward the landscape business because I, I had a, 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 you know, 
sort of entrepreneurial edge, I guess you could say, from a young age. I was selling firewood and topsoil and planting cedar hedges and mowing lawns through high school and enjoyed that kind of work, really liked working outside. And as I kind of got a little bit further into that decision-making process, I had an opportunity to do a nuclear apprenticeship. So it was like welding and steam fitting. And so right out of high school, I started my apprenticeship instead of going to college or starting a landscape company. But that urge to start a landscape company never really left. And so I found myself doing some jobs on the weekends, mostly like install jobs, decks, fences, that kind of thing. I, I grew up doing a lot of carpentry work. And so I uh, I was pretty skilled in that type of work. And so my weekend warrior type uh, side hustle was always um, doing decks and fences. So continued on with my apprenticeship, uh, finished up my apprenticeship, ended up uh, in a supervisory role. And the pay was incredible, but I didn't really like the environment. I just found the people were a little bit negative. There was definitely a lot of... Um, uh, Stress, I would say, a lot really long hours working in a building with no windows, as you can imagine, being nuclear. Kind of go in in the dark in the morning and come home in the dark in the night. It just wasn't really for me. So the pay was incredible, but I had a bit of a turning point uh, one day working uh, in that role with uh, my supervisor and decided to leave. And uh, so I went on and uh, started the landscaping business. And that, I never really looked back, but uh, the first couple of years were definitely pretty bumpy. Lots of uh, lots of learning lessons and leaving a really good paying job uh, to start a landscape business was difficult. And it was kind of a questionable decision by, by others in my life at the time. But uh, I stuck with it and the first year did go miraculously well. I had a phenomenal first year. So there was, there was, uh, not much left in the bank at the end of the year, but I did have um, tremendously good sales and the business kind of started to take off pretty quickly. And I started out doing landscape maintenance uh, and snow for residential and uh, landscape install for residential. So lots of pavers, lots of uh, woodwork, lots of planting, lots of landscape lighting, that kind of thing. So uh, business went really well. Uh, I guess about that was 1997. So it's about 10 years later, the business was um, in around 10 million in sales. Uh, things were going incredibly well, but I was finding it really difficult to manage all of the efficiency to make sure that people understood how many hours jobs should take and what material to use and all these things were starting to kind of get crazy. And that is when I decided to build software. Um, I just really wanted to build software that would allow us to budget, estimate and manage the work really efficiently. That was that was kind of what I wanted to do uh, uh, when we decided to build software. So that was how I got into the software game. And then that kind of fueled some hyper growth. I was always testing my own products, as you can imagine. And um, somehow 10 years later, the business was uh, 50 million in sales. Uh, we were, I think, 60th or so on the top 100 list. And uh, we had the highest revenue per hour in the industry at that point in time. And, and so things were going really well, but I had a decision to make. I was finding myself pretty uh, worn out running both the landscape business and trying to grow the software business. And I had to make a decision. You can't be CEO of two companies and do a great job. And so I made the hard decision to uh, to move on and uh, focus on the software business. And uh, since then, the, uh, the software business has grown exponentially. Uh, since 2018, we've grown about 10, 10x growth since then. It's been a very, uh, very steady ride. Lots of new products, lots of new customers, lots of new problems as we scale up. And, and today, LMN is uh, a total of about 175 people um, that make up our company. And we work together every day to build software and help landscapers unlock their true potential. The... Uh, um... It's funny, I feel like I've met about 20 to 30% of the team um, just in the last uh, six or so weeks. I had the opportunity to 
um, meet your team at the Winter Snow Show, at Launchpreneur Academy Live, at your mastermind in Novi, Michigan. And uh, I took a trip up to the Element HQ in Toronto. I uh, was able to fly down to Orlando for the Element Summit and then um, been able to use the uh, onboarding team to uh, help us, you know, as we onboard to LMN uh, and bother all those folks. I think I owe everybody pizza. Uh, they are, <laughs> they're a godsend, I'll tell you that. Um, so it's been really cool to see, you know, the behind the scenes of LMN and really get to know the folks. And, you know, you can't fake... It's hard to, I don't know the best way to describe this, but you can't fake like good employees. Your, your team is as passionate and dedicated to the customer, the you know user of LMN, us as contractors, as much as you are. And uh, some folks come to mind like Adam and Jason and uh, Kiko and, um, you know, all these folks are just awesome, awesome individuals. And you can't fake that passion, right? Like it's not like we were special guests and everybody turned on the... Uh, the smiley face, you know? So um, I think that's, again, a direct result of your leadership um, and everything that you guys are putting together. So just want to say, like, I've been really impressed. And if you guys are looking to hook your caboose up, I just want you guys to have a little bit more context about who Mark is. It's not just another scheduler. It's not just another software. Um, something that you actually said recently, Mark, and now we can get into the software here in just a quick second, was, and maybe you want to spend a quick minute on this, but it was really the... You called LMN the operating system for how you approach business. And uh, I think you opened with that at your LMN Summit with your speech or keynote. And um, I took notes. Jeremiah Jennings with Growing Green, he took notes. And I think 100 other people in that room wrote that line down. And I was hoping you could expand upon that a little bit more because – Hey, there's a bunch of great software out there, no doubt about it. And again, no no pitch here to get you guys to sign up with LMN. I'm just telling you, it's not just the software. It was Mark and Mark's philosophy of business, that operating system is what I'm attracted to. So, Mark, could, could you take five minutes and describe, like, what do you mean by the operating system, the mentality of, of LMN and what it's really unlocking for guys that are stuck at that 300, 400 grand in revenue, maybe to a million, million two, they, they're looking to grow. They're excited about growing, but Hey, new levels, new devils, right? So there's a lot of new things you have to, um, rethink about, right? You have to change the leader. You have to approach differently as you continue to grow your business. I know you're constantly talking about ones and threes. So, um, would you mind taking just five minutes? I know it's kind of a little bit of a side tangent, uh, kind of a question, but I think Folks need to understand that we're not just talking about software today. We want to talk about building an operating system as you look to approach your business and, and how to do it effectively, predictably. And, and there is a right way to build your business. I, I know that sounds weird. And, and then frankly, to just, just be that guy, Mark wouldn't say this, but I will. There's just so many folks, admittedly, that have a podcast, a YouTube, an Instagram that are putting out content that I just struggle to truly believe that they all, and I say this with love, know what they're talking about. And I don't want to be the blind leading the blind on our content and our channel. So, uh, Mark, I'll kick that back over to you. Um, I know you know what I'm talking about. You led with this all day on the first day uh, of your mastermind. So I'll let you maybe fill in a couple of those uh, puzzle pieces here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when I say operating system, it's it's. I, I feel like... I've spent the last 30 years really, truly learning how to run a business. Um, I, I'm 49, and this is all I've really thought about since I was about 18. And throughout the years, um, I think I was really fortunate to have the trade skills that I have. I mean, I, I, my father was a plumber. He built homes and did renovations and I just my trade skills were really good and I my brother was 10 years older he was always teaching me I, I was just really set with the craft um, but what I realized very quickly is you know knowing how to do the work and having a good work ethic that doesn't really fly when it comes to running a business and unfortunately great landscapers oftentimes are great technicians with amazing work ethics and 
people want to run businesses because they've got this entrepreneurial urge in them. And I just think that that needs a little bit of help for most people who haven't gone to business school. For me, I learned all those lessons the hard way. And ultimately, I think as you look at purpose in life, and everybody has to look at purpose at some point in time, uh, this industry has been incredible to me. Like financially, I could not have imagined um, reaching the level that I've that I've reached in the past twenty five years. My, I just recently a, a, a friend was asking me what I where I want to be twenty five years from now, and I I started explaining where I wanted to be and the impact that I wanted to have on this industry, and he said, um, "Man, that doesn't sound big enough." And uh, and I said, well, it seems pretty big to me. And he said, well, look back 25 years at where you were. And like, would you have thought that you would have gotten to where you are right now? Which was a pretty, pretty interesting thing to think about. And my, my answer was, yeah, no, probably not. Um, and so he was challenging me to think bigger um, about my next 25 years in this conversation. Uh, which is something I like to do, you know, usually with people thinking more like five to 10 years, but I appreciated this conversation. And so when I think about what I want to do and what I want to really work on, it's to teach people my operating system, what I learned over 30 years. And that's what I want to do for the next uh, 25 or 30 years of my life. I, I can't picture myself retiring. I don't really want to get into another business I'm not interested. I'm not the serial entrepreneur that wants to go and invest in 20 other things. It's just, I'm a landscaper. I just happen to build software. And so the software supports an operating system that I developed over many years. And that's everything from the way that I plan the business, the way that I set goals. It's the way that I create budgets, the way that I um, focus on paying my staff way above average wages. It's the way that I sell. It's the way that I price the work. It's the way that I package the work so that I can really sell more effectively and get better close rates. It's the way that I do my marketing. It's the way that I grow staff. It's the way that I deliver the product and the way that I train my staff to do so. And so that whole operating system is wrapped into LMN and Greenius. And so this has just been something I've been building upon for many, many years. And like over the past five years or so, since I retired from landscaping, I really scaled the staff up. I really built the product um, out to, to where I'd like, where I always wanted to see it go. And I acquired Greenius and I built a learning management platform where people can build their own courses or embed YouTube videos and build their own learning management system. Uh, right now, we're just deploying the industry's first online apprenticeship program so that everybody can hire people, stop using the, the terminology labor, hire apprentices, put them on a training program and keep them. Um, and, and that's really where my passion lies at this point is transforming the industry and truly developing a really sustainable workforce. And that, I think that requires a lot more than just software, that requires an operating system. And so the mastermind program combined with software training, the software tools, the Greenius training program for owners, salespeople, field staff, designers, estimators, um, a really fulsome way of of really building the team is what I think it takes. And so that entire operating system sits inside of LMN and Greenius. And then in addition, I took a million dollars plus worth of IP that I had developed to build my top 100 landscape company. And I embedded that in the forms library and in the course library of LMN and, and you get all of that for free the day you sign up. And it's literally, I, I had a cost code in my accounting for years for systems development and it was $1.2 million worth of time and effort, not including my own pay to build all of those systems out and, and streamline them. And so those are all like, there's 800 forms and documents and systems and flow charts for people to grow into. And so as you're, you know, at your stage, starting to scale up the way that you're thinking of, all of those systems are going to be needed. 
and you kind of grow into those systems. And that's really what LMN and the operating system stands for. Yeah, and uh, we got a little sneak peek of that at your Mastermind Summit, um, you know, a couple of the different sessions and talk about a breath of fresh air. So again, here, here's the reality. Again, if you guys are listening into this um, and we'll queue up the software um, and show you guys a little bit more, it's nothing like super probably like overwhelmingly exciting, but it is exciting to me. Um, what I'll just say is if you guys are doing 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand and you're an owner operator, a uh, small business, um, do we love you? That's fine. That's a great business. Maybe you're just looking to make some extra cash to pay for a trip to Disney. I get it. Um, maybe Element is or isn't for you, but the education, like Mark said, that's available. If it's not free, it's nominally you know, priced and you can operate uh, on a shoestring budget to get access to it. If you guys are in the middle, and really I want to focus on folks in the middle because I've said this many times on our content. I don't feel like there's enough folks out there that are putting out real advice that is helpful for guys between 300 to a million uh, because it seems like and Mark, I don't know if you can relate, but it seems like just all of a sudden you have this five, $10 million company. And frankly, the more I do um, more conversations with folks, you realize that maybe some of even them don't have it all figured out. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of uh, companies out there that do 10 million and uh, lose money, you know, and uh, no shade to them uh, by any means, because they have a bigger company than I do. But the, the point of this whole conversation is I really just, I'm going to champion something here for the next 12, 18, 24 months as we try to grow and look to grow is I want to take the guesswork out of this thing. And uh, I had a buddy earlier, he uh, was texting me and great buddy of mine. And he said, uh, Hey man, is LMN the real deal? <clears throat> We're shooting text messages back and forth. And I said, yeah, it's awesome. He said, you know, whatever the uh, price was four or 500 bucks a month. He goes, that's expensive. And I said, expensive is guessing, you know? So at the end of the day, uh, not here to sell or convince anybody, but if you're still guessing, we we need to maturely approach business and go from a technician to an owner, and we need to stop guessing, right? We need to build our business in a predictable fashion. So again, I'm not here to sell or convince anybody that that's what you need to do, but it, Liz and I, as we have more people on staff, uh, tens of thousands of dollars of payroll, I can't be guessing as we grow our company. Okay, so we're going to jump into the software here, show you a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, I have so many great testimonies and success stories just for myself because that's the, the uh, I'm the uh, case study today um, where I'm already convinced that Element's a great uh, investment for us. We actually just got a bid back um, on Monday evening that was 15 percent higher uh, how we bid it in terms of, you know, the retail price and then also what we're going to make for profit. And if I wouldn't have used LMN and some of the pricing um, tools in our budget to know what we actually need to charge in price, I would have left 15% uh, of profit on the table and basically made no money. And we would have worked 111 hours for free with my crew over the course of a six month agreement. And I'm just thinking to myself, you only need two or three accounts like that to pay for your membership for the year. Right. Um, I know that you have a great stat mark on the, the homepage. If you do a trial, it says 10 percent more profit, 20 percent more this and 50 uh, percent more closing or whatever it is. I am a believer like I have tangibly seen that. And we're just starting to get on board with our bids and our estimates. I have a lot of homework to do over the next couple of weeks, just like a lot of you guys. There's still plenty of time to switch and graduate if you guys are looking to. I know that could be a big overwhelming. Well, hey, the season's starting. Hey, trust me. The team is here behind the scenes to help you guys on board if you need to and if you want to. So don't don't fret. Uh, Mark's got a great system and a great team to help you do that. So, um, again, without further ado, I don't want to ramble here, but uh, Mark, if you want to, again, uh, I had a, a buddy last night in our uh, live stream in our Facebook membership. He said, dude, I've never heard of anybody opening up the hood and showing their business and what they're going to do and charge and make. He's like, that's ballsy, brother. And I said, um, I'm an open book. I don't care. I said, uh, I'm in the bonus round of life, Mark. Like you were saying earlier, uh, you you hit all your wildest uh, dreams and imaginations and far sur, uh, surpassed that. Liz and myself were in the bonus round. We come from very humble beginnings and backgrounds. Uh, I grew up in a double wide trailer. Liz grew up in Dearborn, Michigan. Very, very humble backgrounds. So the fact that we're making the money we are and have made it this far and we're still married and haven't killed each other along the way. Uh, just kidding. 
uh, we're in the bonus round too. So anything I can do to just serve you guys and show you what we're doing, um, I think I owe it to you guys with the success that we've had, uh, both from Social and our lawn care company, because so many of you guys have poured into us over the years as well. So um, I just want to be here for you guys and show you what we're doing. So Mark, you can take it away and uh, you're the wizard here, brother. So what are we looking at here? Let's go. Yeah, well, uh, so getting started with LMN, the, the first thing that we usually try to recommend people do is build a budget. Um, you can use LMN without creating a budget, but I built the software with budgeting as step one um, for a reason. Because if you don't have a budget, you really are guessing. And the stats on uh, company success of people with a budget versus people without are honestly staggering. You know, that that when you hear about businesses typically going out of business in the first four years, businesses who have a budget cut that um, risk down by about 95%. So incredible uh, success stats for people who have a budget because they understand how much money needs to come in to the business, how much is going to go out and what's going to be left before the year starts. And that allows them to run in a very, very different way from your typical business where they're kind of like operating on a cash basis, you know, just kind of money in, money out, hoping that it all balances out at the end of the year and that there's an actual profit. And so we like to start with a budget. Um, and I'm going to show you Brian's budget. You can see there's a couple of budgets here. There's a sample budget, which is just an LMN sample. Then there's an optimistic budget, which is, this is Brian's moonshot for this year, 660,000. And somehow we're gonna make that happen. And the realistic sales budget, which is the safe bet. This is, if everything kind of goes according to plan and Brian's not out there hustling and selling the way he uh, he's promising the world here, then uh, well, 560 is gonna cut it. And so that's kind of how we're gonna look at it. And uh, at the end of the day, 560 would be a big home run for, for Brian. It's, a, it's up from last year. It's a growth year, which is amazing. As he said, he's super busy. He's got life happening. He's building a house. He's got young kids. He's got uh, two businesses, you know, the, the uh, media business and the um, landscape business. And so this is pretty big growth, but he's got a great team. All of his staff are returning. So we'll go ahead and open up this realistic budget and we'll kind of go through what we were thinking. So um, first thing you'll notice when you get on a budget here is the first page actually shows you the sales goal, the profit goal, and the profit margin. And again, this is the realistic version. This is like not the moonshot, but if everything goes according to plan, this is how things are going to shape up. So we've called this the realistic budget for Brian's lawn maintenance. Now down here under the work breakdown, this is a really important component of LMN. What LMN is designed to do is give you um, benchmarking analytics as you build your estimate to help you kind of stay between the ditches a little bit when you're kind of creating your plan to make sure that you don't over plan expenses for labor, material, equipment, and subs and overhead. And so what we want to do is we want to kind of look forward into the year and say, what's the percentage of the work that's going to be install? And in Brian's case, 15%, maintenance, 62%, irrigation, 3%, and then snow and ice, 20%. So when we update these, what that does is it tells the system how to, how to formulate benchmarks based on the work mix because the, the benchmarks are different in each of these segments. So for example, if you did all design build, you'd have very different benchmarks than a company that did all snow or all maintenance. And in Brian's case, he's doing a little bit of everything and so the system's going to serve up benchmarks that are really accurate to Brian's specific business rather than just sort of peanut butter uh, benchmarks. And so the system has an algorithm in the background that does all of that automatically. And so as we go through this budget, when we look at the benchmarks, that's where they're derived from. So the first thing we're looking at here is Brian's um, sales budget for the year. And again, when you sign up for LMN, 
you get an onboarding specialist who helps you build this budget, they'll take your financials from last year, or they can just do a Q&A with you and help you build a budget. So we actually help you through this process. We have courses for you to, to, to learn as well, right down here on the left side of LMN. We have online courses where you can just click and take a course online on your own, or you can use our chat any time of day, or again, you can sit in on a live virtual training with our education team or work one-to-one -one with your onboarding specialist. So there's lots of ways to get set up. And ultimately, when we get into budgeting, it's a fairly simple process, but you've, if you've never done it before, it might be scary. You know, ultimately, if you're an amazing landscaper, you might not be a financial expert if you're like me. And so when I started my business, this wasn't, this wasn't natural for me either. I had to work at this. I had to go to night school and learn all about accounting. And then I had to hire lots of business consultants to teach me how to create overhead recovery and make all the things work together. And what we did with LMN was just build a budgeting system that your average person can use without having to do all that research. And so we really tried to make this simple. So when you're building a budget, you basically put your division names in. And so you can see here, Brian has maintenance. His previous revenue in maintenance was 225,000. We're forecasting uh, 275, which is a difference of 22%. So he's planning to grow by 22% in maintenance. Next up, spring and fall cleanups. Uh, Brian's going to shift some of his billing into hourly and try to really leverage some of the billing and pricing and packaging that we recommend as part of our operating system to sort of double up revenue without really having to double up a lot of work. And so oftentimes when people package spring and fall cleanups, they end up really kind of taking it on the chin a little bit here because they often end up putting a lot more labor out in the spring and fall um, than they were planning. And ultimately that's where oftentimes a lot of landscape maintenance companies don't end up making any money. And, and to be honest, this is kind of a sad stat, but most companies who start using LMN, uh, they quickly realize within a few months that about half of their contracts were bid below cost. And sometimes the other half are, are above cost. And what happens is at the end of the year, there's not really very good profit. They don't know why, and they just kind of keep doing the work, uh, you know, renewing the work for the same prices year after year. The reality is, is if you drop half the business, you'd probably make a little bit more profit. Um, but the good news is, is when you start pricing it right, most companies are afraid to put the right price forward, thinking they won't renew. But usually most customers do renew. And the few that you lose aren't really a big issue because you've got more revenue and now you've lost those jobs that were losing money can i can i uh jump in on that i gotta piggyback that's such a good thought because six years ago we switched crms uh to yardbook like you guys know yardbook um and by the way that's from zero software and uh i actually was going to move with a charge card on file system that was like a big push a while back and uh i talked quite a bit as you guys know my story that uh folks were saying dude you're gonna lose half of your business moving that way and i said well that's fine because i I uh, still, have, still have half of my money owed to me uh, in business, and I feel like I'm a professional debt collector, not a landscaper. So <laughs> if I lost half of my business, I didn't care anyway. And, it's, and it sounds funny, and it's the truth, but guys, think about it similarly. Uh, that job I just quoted, uh, we were basically about to do it uh, at our break even, and we wouldn't have made any money. And we would have put time and effort and billing and liability – right, to go out there for 26, 29 visits, do all this work to make no money. And I've got a couple others. Um, I don't call them like success stories, but fun stats of my business that I've learned in the last three weeks as I went on through the onboarding. Uh, and uh, Michael that was talking to me, we were pricing out some of my services and he's like, so uh, what do you think you're uh, making and charging with X, Y, and Z? And I said, oh, 50% margin, we're killing it. And uh, we go through the budget tool and uh, our templates. And I come to find out that not only are we not making money, we're losing money. And I will tell you transparently, if you would have told me three weeks ago what I thought about that division of my company, I would have said 50% margin, one of my best revenue generators. And three weeks later, after actually knowing our numbers, right? The good old knowing your numbers that everybody champions, 
and still nobody can give me a direct answer about what that means. Uh, we were losing money and paying to do it. And we we're losing about $50 per hour, if you will, on that service. Uh, no more, no more. So uh, I've got little, little micro success stories and little things that we're dialing in. And again, folks, not here to convince you. I'm just saying for me, I'm, I'm excited. One, because we're going to be making more money. But two, imagine the freedom that gives me now to accurately price our work. And now I'm just looking around and I'm like, like the Terminator mark. Everything turned red. And I'm just ready to get out there and, uh, you know, start making uh, bids and proposals and estimates. So um, I just wanted to jump in because uh, that's a real success story. Like that's tangible for me and my family and my guys. Like we can make more money. Uh, and it, this stuff right here is just unlocking so much for us that, gosh, I wish I would have saw this five years ago, to be honest with you. That's amazing. Yeah, so we uh, we go on down the list here. We've got maintenance, spring and fall cleanups, landscape enhancements, which there's a big jump this year. We're we're looking to take uh, fifty thousand up to one hundred twenty five thousand, and snow and ice. We're looking to to grow uh, moderately from seventy five to one hundred. And so what you see here is up on the top right, forty nine point three percent growth going from 375 up to 560,000. So that's the plan. The sales breakdowns up here in this little graph, very simple. If we wanted to create a new sales division, all we do is click this new button, fill in the blanks like a spreadsheet. So this is very easy. The budgeting tool is incredibly uh, user-friendly, not hard to figure out. And again, we help you set this up the first time you get in here. So on the left, we started at budget info, we moved down to sales. Now we're into the field labor budget. A couple of things with field labor. Basically what we do is we input the labor burden, which in um, state of Michigan uh, for Brian adds up to 17%. Now that's gonna be a little bit different state to state and company to company. But in Brian's case, every time he pays $100 to an employee, there's $17 of expense coming his way to pay the government for that employee. And that's called labor burden. And so that's a combination of the taxes that the employer has to pay on behalf of the employee. Not the employee taxes, just the employer side. And so that's labor burden. So 17% there. We put an overtime multiplier here of 1.5 if overtime was ever to be the case. And then what you see down here is the hourly and salary employees. And so here we've got a new hire that's yet to be hired. This is a part-time position. So we've got one person, Brian's forecasting 600 hours for this person at $18 an hour. And there's no bonus attached to this person. So the total cost is 10,800. Then under salaried staff, we've got Oh, we've got names here I won't show. Uh, we've got the names of people listed um, and their wages. And so we won't show anybody's name and wages here today. So we'll skip that. But under salaried staff are uh, Brian's other three employees. So here what we've got is the total hours for Brian's staff, the total cost of the wages, the total burden uh, which is, again, the government contributions and the total cost of payroll. So Brian's uh, facing almost 190000 in field payroll to generate the revenue of 560000 And so what we're looking at here is a field labor ratio. And what this, this ratio is really important. You need to know what your field labor ratio is to do all kinds of neat things in your business but the one thing that you really need to know is every time $100 comes into the company, $28.90 is going to go out just to pay the labor. So this is just a ratio to sales. And when you start to look at it that way, you get really sort of comfortable knowing how much of your revenue is going just to pay the staff and then how much is going to go to pay equipment, material, subcontractors and overhead and then how much is left over? And so these ratios really matter because at the end of the day, when we bring $100 in, we can only cut it 100 ways. And so 28.9% is gonna go toward the field labor. 
the industry average based on the work mix that we updated when we first started, when we said that uh, Brian had a, a work breakdown that included maintenance, it included some irrigation, it included some installation work and some snow. So based on his mix and his actual company mix, not an industry standard that's peanut butter spread, but the work breakdown that he updated, he should be um, in around 30.8%. And so that would be the industry average based on Brian's work mix. He's actually trending a little bit lower, 28.9, which is perfect. We want to be plus or minus 2%. And so he's right in the range. And you see it lights up green, which actually tells uh, Brian there's no risk. If, the, if we were outside of the safe range, it would light up red. And that would sort of warn Brian that he's not producing enough revenue to have this many employees. And so the system kind of helps you um, right size your labor force based on your sales that you're going to generate and the sales breakdown that you've got in your company. And that's kind of an important thing. And so again, when we talk about an operating system, this is a program that keeps you in sort of safe harbor. It's it's These are benchmarks that are well known that people that were consulting landscapers long before I ever got into the industry had developed I was good. I had the good fortune of learning from some amazing consultants in the industry, people like uh, Charles Vanderkoy and, and Jim Houston and John Paul LaMarche, people that were doing this back in the 70s and 80s. When they were teaching me, I remember getting taught with pen and paper and calculators, but these benchmarks have been around for a long time in the landscape industry and in other installation industries like uh, construction and other service industries um, as well, like HVAC and others. And so once you understand this math and the way it pertains specific to um, this industry, you can really get good at sort of planning your business year to year as you grow, because you actually think in terms of ratios instead of dollars. And you can imagine when my business was at its peak, we were doing about a million five a week in revenue. So you can picture that's a that's a, a lot of business to figure out every day of the week. We were kind of in that three hundred thousand dollars a day in sales, and so to do three hundred thousand dollars a day, all I had to always think about was my estimates and the health of the estimates, and I had to think about these ratios. I couldn't think about dollars. It just I I couldn't keep up with the dollars. But the ratios really are where you kind of safeguard yourself. And so what you begin to realize is these ratios carry through to your estimates. So there's a relationship between planning your year here and each estimate. So when we start showing you some of Brian's estimates, keep these labor ratios in mind, because when you analyze your estimate, you always make sure that your estimate is in line with your budget. And that way, you can kind of be sure that every time you price a job, you're going to end up profitable. I'll get back to that, but it's important that you just remember how important this ratio really is. It's one of the backbone components to the operating system. Uh, anything to add there, Brian, before I move on? No, I actually uh, just saw an Instagram message come through my phone, Sarasota Lawns. He said, just switched over to LMN, best decision ever. Uh, it's funny. Uh, nope, uh, people are switching and signing up as we go, so that's actually kind of funny. Um, Anyway, yeah, this right here, uh, the field staff, and that actually includes uh, raises that we've already projected for 24 as well. I just uh, proud of myself, proud of uh, giving our guys raises. Uh, I remember you saying when you sold your company, your l what, lowest guy, if you will, was making three times the uh, minimum wage average for your company. And uh, the room, I think that was like a mic drop moment. Is that what they call that? <laughs> and, uh, and that doesn't even count what your uh, man hour uh, rate was at, at the prime. So there's a lot to learn here, but no, go ahead. Uh, this is, this is great. And if what well, one thing I will say is when somebody says budget, you think like your home budget, you know, what we can spend eating out or what our mortgage costs. And, you know, we need to make 4,000 bucks a month, but I feel like your, uh, mastermind was the first time somebody had ever proposed to me to use a budget to project future growth. 
you know, again, usually I feel like I'm always doing an autopsy with a budget, you know, um, hey, like try to stay within the lines. This is more saying, hey, if you want to buy more equipment and give people raises and, uh, you know, grow, this is like the blessing to go do that as long as you hit that revenue goal. And it's um, kind of like your compass, or your GPS. I, I kind of crude in my analogies, but that's what it feels like for me. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're spot on when you the beautiful part about budgeting is you can run a scenario. I always call them like what if scenarios. You can run a scenario before the year starts and say, hey, what happens if I add a truck or add a crew and add some more work? How much more work do I need in order to keep that crew busy and still end up profitable? Because I think what I've seen over the years and I've been teaching budgeting and estimating 10 years longer than I've even had software. I've been, this is our 15th year selling software, but for 25 years, I've been teaching other landscapers how to budget and estimate. And so throughout all of those years, what I noticed is that people oftentimes will add a truck, add a crew, get a little bit more business, but not enough more business to justify all that extra expense. And so they'll work all year just to pay for the extra equipment and the extra staff and then find out at the end of the year, there's no money left. There's no profit. In fact, they don't even have enough money to make the, the rent or mortgage payments. And so that's really sad to me. That's a that's a struggle that I just really don't want to see people have. And I've had many, many mistakes, many struggles with cash flow and mistakes and legal issues and everything under the sun in my career. And I'm very honest about how difficult it is to overcome a lot of the the hard lessons learned along the way of growing a company as fast as I did. I really, truly want to help other people avoid the pain and the struggle that I had in growing a business. And I, that really is my mission at this point in time. I want to create a, a thriving landscape industry. And when I say a, a thriving industry, that's that's not just the owners that's also the employees in the industry. Like I really do believe that we need to find a way to raise the floor in this industry to the point where people can live a, a middle-class lifestyle when they're working in this industry. And I know that that's possible and I'm, and I'm convinced it's possible, but it does take some financial literacy and it really starts with a budget here. And I think, you know, Brian, uh, you know, not to not to give you too big of a pat on the back, but you're paying some really good fair wages, like and and not many business owners um, focus on that as much as you do. And I think that's uh, that's definitely um, something that needs to change in this industry. It's something we all need to really focus on. And when you build a budget like this and you put the right wages in, um, like here, here, Brian's part time person is making eighteen dollars an hour. When we get into estimating, you're going to see how much his staff are making per hour. They're paid really well. Uh, we just aren't clicking on the salary because we don't want to show names and, and rates just for privacy reasons. But we're going to get to that later. And, you know, paying staff fair wages fixes a lot of problems. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. So next up is the equipment budget. Now, here we've got all of Brian's equipment. And so we've got his fuel for the coming years, 21,000. We've got 5,000 in repairs. Brian Smart, he runs new equipment, not a lot of repairs. Uh, he's got a, a good team that are well-trained. They're not damaging the equipment. They really care about Brian. They care about the company. They're part of the company. You know, one thing I really respect about Brian is he, he says the guys that work with me, not the guys that work for me. And that's an important thing. Like, always having that attitude that everybody in the world is an entrepreneur and they come to work with you in your company, that changes the, the narrative. And I think that's where you attract and keep really great people because I do think that everybody's an entrepreneur. And at the end of the day, people get out of bed every day to go to work for themselves, to support themselves and support their families. And in that they're working for themselves. They just work with a company. And so I really believe in unlocking that entrepreneurial spirit in everybody. And I think you do have to pay well and you've got to really give them fair wages, fair training, fair chance, fair equipment and set them up for success with a transparent organization. And like $5,000 in repairs, how is that so low? Well, I know how it's low. 
investing in the right equipment and training the staff to use it well. And so like, as you go through your budget, use these items as like sort of wake up moments. If your repairs are really high, ask yourself why. There's probably a reason. And oftentimes it is training of staff, age of equipment, you know, some obvious things there. But down here, we've got snow plows, salters, a debris loader, dump insert. We've got an enclosed trailer package. We've got a, a 60 inch X mark. We've got a F-250 and F-350. Uh, maintenance crew trailer, an open deck trailer, and a quad. Wait a minute. Are you actually using that for landscaping? Hey, no, we, uh, we, we put a plow on it, so it qualifies. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. I'm not hey, the, 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 the dang plow costs almost a third as much as the freaking plow, you know, or as the, <laughs> as, as the four wheeler. Unbelievable. <laughs> Everybody needs a four wheeler on their equipment list. Um, Makes sense. All right. Now down here, uh, if I'm just going to open up one item here, just to give people an idea of how easy it is to build a, an item like this. So let's just click on, um, let's go with uh, a group. So a group is like a series of items. And so I'm going to open up Brian's enclosed trailer. And what you'll see here is we've got the enclosed trailer. Purchase price is 20,000. The resale price is five. He's gonna keep it for seven years. And so the cost per year on that trailer is 2,100. We've got the X mark, price is 14. Resales, 6,000, three years from now, cost per year. And so what you see happening here is put the purchase price, the resale value and the cost per, and the number of years you're gonna keep it. And it blends out a cost for that trailer with all of these things in it. And so this is pretty important um, when you're when you're grouping things. And then if I just look at a pickup truck, like for example, this F-350, it's owned, it's $60,000 truck, $200 in admin costs. He's gonna keep it for six years. At the end of the day, the estimated retail or um, value at the end of its life is 40,000. He's got a 6.49% interest rate. And so it's come, coming up with a monthly cost and an annual cost. And again, as you come through this list, whether you own the equipment and, it, and you don't have any payments on it or not, we still enter it into the system. And we still even factor out what a monthly cost would be because we really try to teach people as part of the operating system even if the equipment's paid for, we want to put it in the budget as though it's as though it's not. And then those payments, we actually want you to take those monthly payments and pay yourself, put it in another bank account, call it a return on investment bank account. And we want to build that equipment to the budget and we want to put the money in that other bank account so that you're not giving your equipment away. Because all too often, especially some of the more old school kind of business owners that don't understand these numbers, they'll buy their equipment, spend all their profit on a new truck. Five years later, or eight years later, that truck's worn out and they have to take another full year's profit to buy a new truck. We don't believe in that. When you take this year's profit and invest it in equipment, you want to make sure that you've got this monthly payment attributed into your budget. You're moving that money into another account. Then later, when you need to buy another truck, you take the money out of your return on investment account. You don't take it out of profit. So your customers are always paying for your equipment and you're estimating and you're always billing your equipment to the budget like this, whether it's owned or not. And so that's a key thing in budgeting that oftentimes business owners just don't understand if they've not really um, gone through this type of an exercise before. So a couple of key numbers that we're trying to surface up top here, we've got the fuel repairs, the vehicle insurance. And what this is telling us now is the equipment expenses are 38,000 and change. The other expenses are these, the fuel repairs and insurance. And the total for equipment in Brian's company, 73,000. If he had some small equipment rentals, you know, when the, something breaks and he needs to run over to Home Depot, we could update that. If he's spending 1,500 or $2,000 a year on small equipment rentals, we'd plug that in right here. Now, 
What this is telling us is Brian spending 13.1% of revenue on equipment. His, the industry average for his work mix is 14.5. So again, Brian's a little under, not too far though. If you're one or 2% under or one or 2% over, your number's still gonna be green. And so in this case, it's a good safe budget for equipment, very healthy, easy to still maintain profit. The next budget we're gonna click on is the materials budget. Now, Brian's not really heavy on installation, so he doesn't have a lot of material expenses, but he's gonna be out buying some mulch. He's gonna have some disposal fees. He's gonna be buying a little Roundup. Actually, a lot of Roundup. <laughs> um, and uh, at the end of the day, what, what we're gonna see here, he didn't uh, update last year's uh, material, but it's not gonna really impact anything over time as Brian is using LMN year after year, this is gonna get easier and easier to do and he'll have that previous number. So right now up top, he doesn't have a previous ratio against the new one. In the future, he'll have that. You can set that up coming out of your QuickBooks numbers or last year's financials, but it's not gonna hurt anything that it's not set. Now for Brian's work mix, he's really low on ratio for materials. Oftentimes companies that are doing as much um, work as Brian would spend as much as 15% on materials, but with his work mix and the style of contracts that he's doing, he's just not spending a lot on materials. And so this is the one ratio where if it's red, we're usually not too concerned, as long as you know that you've put enough material in the budget because Every business is quite different with how much material they use, even if they're doing install work. And so in this case, it's very low, but again, Brian's primarily doing maintenance activities, maintenance and snow. So there's just not a lot of material. Next up is the subcontracting budget. Now, Brian does do a fair bit of subcontracting here. He's subcontracting $58,000 worth of work. And so that's 10.4% of sales, which is actually a pretty high number. Um, so it's something to be mindful of. And what we'll probably see is over time, as Brian's company grows, this ratio is likely to come down because he's probably not gonna keep subcontracting to, to facilitate sales. He's gonna be self-performing most of the work. Um, and so what you're seeing here is he's got some snow subs, not very much. He's got some tree work and pruning some salting, some fertilizer, and some planting. And so he's got a $58,000 subcontracting budget. Again, there's no average here. So what you're missing is a benchmark and there is no benchmark for subcontracting. The reason there's no benchmark is because there's no right and wrong and every company is gonna subcontract different ratios. So we want you to know what percentage of sales you're spending but we don't serve up a benchmark because there are no guardrails. Generally speaking, when you're subcontracting, provided you're marking them up, there's no room for a loss. And so we, there is no benchmark here. We don't need to be concerned with that. Now, the next budget is the big one, the overhead budget. This one is really important. When you start to look at your overhead, this is where most contractors really don't understand their business very well. They just aren't clear on how much money they're spending on overhead. And so sometimes people think they're making 30% profit and they're not really making profit at all because maybe their overhead's 30%. And this is this is usually a real eye opener during budgeting. Brian, how did how did this shape up for you? How did was this was there a surprise at all with your overhead percentage or how did you feel? Um admittedly, you know, <laughs> uh Again, I, I do a lot of autopsy, right? Like year over year, based on conversations with our bookkeeper or CPA, how do we feel like the year sh um, shook out, right? Or shakes down. And none of this is, uh, again, forward thinking. And I struggle with that because it doesn't give me the confidence that my company is going in the right direction. It's like setting your GPS on January 1st and not looking at it again until December 31st. And so, uh, for me personally, I really want to work on this a lot more. And this is our best guess from what we took from last year's QuickBooks. Uh, admittedly, some of these could be, you know, a couple percentages uh, higher or lower. This is the, the data that we have. Uh, I'm actually really excited about partitioning a lot of these uh, categories into subcategories. Uh, it's the first time we've really paid attention to 
a lot of these areas of the business. Uh, I think it, the numbers are accurate for what we um, have access to. But again, I this was the alarming part of the whole conversation, switching to LMN. Or, or let's even just broadly speaking, zoom out. How many times, like you just said, Mark, folks will say, maybe even as an owner operator, well, I did a hundred grand and uh, I have 50% uh, margin because I, you know, had 50 grand left over in profit. And I said, well, like, did you even factor overhead? Did you factor a salary for yourself? Or is that just what you have left over is profit? Like what, what semantics, but it's really important. And so I say, well, if you had 50 grand left over, then you paid yourself a 40 grand salary. Well, technically you have 10 grand left over or 10% profit, right? So again, as we mature as business owners, as we mature, the language of business as we get our terms correct, our definitions correct, and as we um, approach business more maturely, like these are things that I'm learning real time. I, I admittedly, I don't have it all figured out. Uh, so I'm, you know, it's it's uh, one side of me is like, how have we been so silly for so long? And the other side of me says, hey, now we've got the tools to um, budget correctly and move forward confidently so uh, I'm sure these numbers are going to change and grow and maybe some of them shrink. Uh, hopefully not the legal department. Hopefully that number continues to go down. Uh, mm -hmm. talk, about, talk about lawsuits and being sued. I've been there, done that. Not fun. Um, but yeah, I think this is a pretty accurate representation of where we're at with the company uh, so far. What, one quick thing, by the way, I know my subcontractor, Mike Bedell, is uh, watching on YouTube. Shout out to Michael Bedell, one of my uh, mentors for sure. Uh, that SALT subcontracting is all him. So, uh, Mike, I'm not saying I'm doing my own salt just yet, but I know one day Mike would, uh, I would imagine, have no problem us graduating and taking that in-house. So if we do that, I think that uh, subcontracting number will uh, go down to about 2 or 3% admittedly. So uh, baby steps, though, baby steps. I, I'm still popping out babies. It's hard to do salt runs when you got little kiddos at home. <laughs> so maybe, maybe the rest of the team wants to take over if they want to continue earning those raises. Hey, eh, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah, I know uh... Uh, over time, I think uh, what what tends to happen with overhead, sometimes small businesses think that they've got low overhead because they're smaller. And that's actually not the case. The truth is smaller businesses normally have higher overhead because what happens is you've got all these expenses, advertising in a shop and rent and uniforms and dues and subscriptions and internet and cell phones and insurance, you've got all these expenses, but you don't have as much revenue to spread it out over. And so the ratio ends up being kind of high. And that's where I think a lot of smaller businesses really feel the, the pain. They don't add this up. They don't see it as a ratio of sales. And so they think they're making a lot more profit when they're pricing work than they actually are. And so if you just look here, Brian's average or ratio is 23.4%. The industry average is quite a bit higher. It's 26.8. Now, this is lighting up red, but it's a good thing that it's this much lower. And so it lights up red to warn Brian that, hey, make sure you've thought of everything because right now your overhead is too good to be true. Now, in Brian's case, it is too good to be true because he. this isn't his only business. So I can notice, you know, I don't see internet on here, um, but probably your other business is paying the internet bill, right? So there's a few little benefits to having two businesses. And, but ultimately, like there's not much that's missing here. This is a really good fulsome list, but Brian's not wasting any money on overhead. If it's not billable work, if it's not contributing to getting the work done, he's not spending money on it. This is a pretty tight budget. Like it really is as tight as you can run it. So when you see an overhead bu budget that is too high, like 30 or 35%, remember you gotta be lean and mean. And Brian, you're a good example of that. And I, I was always very, very mindful of that. I always wanted to run the lowest overhead possible so that I could be really competitive with my pricing and it gave me a little bit of extra money to pay my staff. I would rather be a little high on my field labor like you are. You're a little bit high on your field labor because you pay your staff really well, but you're not wasting money on your shop and your facilities and all these other expenses.
Uh, so the three areas of an overhead budget, one is the overhead expenses. Number two, I'm just going to click here on overhead wages and you'll see there's two wages in here. So there's an admin wage for 19,000 for some admin help. And then Brian's got part of his wage in here. He also makes money obviously off of his media company and he's going to take an owner's draw out of profit because the company's profitable. And so he's got the bulk of his, uh, he's got his wage spread out, but he's got his overhead time worked into the overhead budget. So, you know, about half Brian's time is running the business, out selling, collecting, organizing the fleet, looking at new contracts, pricing jobs, going and doing banking, dealing with the government remittances, all the stuff that we hate doing. Um, that's where Brian gets paid for this because this isn't going to get billed to a customer directly, but it will in the markup system. And so what this budget does is it takes all of these expenses and it spreads them out every time you estimate automatically so that you recover all of these costs every time you price a job. And I'll talk about how that happens here in a few minutes, but it's important this is accurate because we want to figure this out in a really um, calculated way so that every time we price jobs using the estimating software, it recoups all of these costs for us and make sure that we actually make the money we have planned. So Brian's got a fancy truck here. You've all seen it on YouTube, I'm sure. Uh, Brian's uh, crew truck is actually put here in overhead because he's using it part of the time out plowing snow, but part of the time just for like doing business, running around doing things that aren't really um, billable. And so when Brian's doing the banking and the sales and all these things, He's not charging a customer for the truck, so we need to put it into overhead. So this portion of Brian's truck is actually here in the overhead budget. And the other half of it would be in the equipment budget if he's out doing the work. So you can split equipment. And for owner operators that are out doing some of the work and running the business, sometimes we'll put half of a truck in here in the overhead equipment and the other half back in that equipment budget that we looked in earlier. That just makes sure that we actually bill our customers for the overhead um, time that we're using our truck. So once we've got the overhead budget in, we've actually entered our revenue on the sales budget and all of the expenses. Now what's next is profit and loss. And again, rather than waiting till the end of the year to wonder whether or not you're actually making money, you get chance to run this what if scenario. So um, Brian and Liz sat down and said, hey, we want to grow the business a little bit. Let's put a plan together and show the, the growth uh, coming up to 560. Let's put all the wages in and the pay increases for the staff. Let's put our own wages in and the new vehicles and our shop. Let's put all of this into the system and make sure that this is going to make money. And so that's ultimately where we are here on this page. So the summary looks like this. Basically, the business is going to profit 81000 That's after paying wages um, for the field staff and Brian's overhead time. It's going to net 14.6%. The revenue breakdown is right here. So all the types of work that Brian's going to do will add up to 560 And then the costs, which cost of goods sold are the items that we actually estimate. And so estimated work is cost of goods sold. So when you hear your accounting company uh, firm tell you cost of goods sold, just always remember that's labor, that's equipment, that's material and subcontracting. And those are the job expenses in your business. That's the work that we actually put on estimates. So when we estimate a job, we add up labor, material, equipment and subs. And those are our job expenses. Then we have to have a fundamental way of marking that work up to recover our overhead and get the profit. And so these ratios get to be really important. You can see that the total job expenses are 62%. So that means every time Brian puts an estimate out, he has to find a way to mark up that those direct expenses by 23% just to get to break even. That's to pay the overhead. So if we said 
every time Brian adds up the labor material equipment and subs, we have to add 23% for overhead. And then we have to add another 14% for profit. That's kind of the profit formula in a business. Now the LMN estimating system does all of this automatically, but this is you learning what your ratios are. And these ratios are super important because if they're not right, you can't make money. It's impossible to make money. And that's unfortunate because as an industry, this makes me sick to report, but there's only a 2% profit in the industry and the average landscape business owner is only paying themselves around $28,000 a year. And so if you look at the profit margin and you look at the wage, it's just not enough. And so ultimately what we wanna do is build plans like this, where we see a nice big profit margin, big healthy wages for the staff, healthy wages for the owner, and ultimately a good outcome for the landscape consumers. Because when you charge enough money to do a good job, you can go out there and do a good job. It's that simple. And so ultimately we want this profit and loss to be healthy. And that's why it's so important to create the plan in advance. Now, all I need to do is click the analysis tab. And this kind of starts to tell me a story about the business. And this is again, part of the operating system of LMN. Now, soon when we get into the estimating software, we're gonna show you Brian's average charge out rate is $69 an hour. Now, what this little window here, capacity and efficiency is telling us is, based on the number of employees Brian has and the number of hours they work per week and per year, based on this charge out rate and adding the equipment and material and subcontractors that he's put into the plan with an overhead markup, his company capacity is actually 601,000. So, this is good news because it's telling us that the sales forecast is actually achievable. Now, again, these are guardrails that LMN puts up. If, the, if this number was lower than his sales goal, everything would light up red and it would tell us, you're predicting more revenue than you have capacity. You don't have enough people to produce that revenue. And so this is telling us whether or not this plan is even achievable, which really is important before you set out at the start of the year. This way we know that we're creating a predictable outcome this year. Now, a couple other cool things that we build into the system. The most important metric in the LMN operating system is revenue per hour. Now, there's lots of debate in the industry about gross profit, net profit, not a lot of talk about revenue per hour. The whole backbone of the success that I had in my landscape business and the success that thousands of companies have with LMN is founded on this one metric. Revenue per hour is the most important metric in your business. There's many, many companies who have incredibly low revenue per hour because they're selling the wrong work, they're not charging enough for that work, and they're, they're doing the work with low-skilled staff who are not well-trained and it's taking too long to do the work. And so they're not producing much revenue for every hour, which just ends up with bad profit and bad wages for everybody in the company. Now, this little window here tells us a few things. Basically, we, we put, punched in 20% downtime. So what that means is 20% of the time, Brian's staff will be loading and unloading trucks and driving from site to site. And we know that. So we're never going to be able to bill for that time. We don't bill our customers for that. So we're actually factoring all of that time right into the equation by updating this 20%. So that gives us our windshield time, our loading and unloading, and our lunch breaks. Now, over here, what this is telling us is based on the forecast, of $560,000 based on the revenue and the number of hours Brian has to work, he's gonna produce $124 an hour. I can tell you that that indicates a few things. A highly trained team, a good salesperson that's selling the work for what it's worth and really good equipment. And so, Many times, landscape maintenance companies, this number is as low as $70 an hour. I've seen it as low as $55 an hour. Those companies are usually on their way out of business. 
Now, when your number is over $95 an hour, you're selling at a premium price, you've got the right equipment, you've got good staff and they're well-trained. And so this is telling us that Brian's company is operating really efficiently, which is no surprise. He, I mean, you follow, follow the YouTube channel, he's got amazing equipment, um, a ton of passion for the, for the industry and a great team. And so this number is highly optimized. I really truly would always suggest that you optimize this number before you plan to grow. So when Brian and Liz came along and said, hey, we wanna grow the business, this was a number I wanted to see right away. I just said like, let's look and make sure that your revenue per hour is healthy. And when I took a look at this and saw this, I, I was really confident that it was a good time to grow for Brian. Because if this number is solid, it's much easier and much more affordable to grow being healthy. If it's not good, then I usually tell people, hey, slow down on the top line growth. Let's get the revenue optimized, get the right business, get higher revenue per hour work, work on training staff, and then grow the business. But again, Brian's in good shape here. Down below, what happens down here is based on Brian's numbers, the software makes suggestions. And so you can kind of see the suggestions that it makes. And again, these are just um, generated by the system based on Brian's numbers. So it's making some suggestions on how to optimize things. And so if there's nothing really standing out, which in this case, not, there's no big problem here. What you will notice is it'll say, well, your material ratio is much lower than expected. And then it's just kind of asking you a few quick questions. Hey, did you remember this? Did you remember that? To make sure that Brian didn't forget anything when he was setting it up. But again, we've gone through this already. So pretty confident. So this is a, this is probably a good place to take a few questions, Brian, and then we can move on to estimating if uh, if you want to open up and uh, or ask me a couple. Well, I mean, first off, if you guys are listening to this on the podcast, you're watching live on the YouTube channel, your mind's uh, admittedly maybe, uh, maybe like mine fried a little bit. Um, it's a lot to take in. And perhaps maybe you've never even like spent any time on this or had the conversation about this. Um, maybe you've never ran your company off of a budget. Uh, can I just be completely transparently honest with you guys? Until we signed up with LMN, we didn't have an operating budget for our company. It was just whatever the company needs, that's what we're paying. Uh, we would lick our thumb and see where the wind is going and see uh, you know, if we were profitable or not uh, based on if the checking account was swelling and swollen uh, by the end of the year or not. And again, uh, we, we did know how to price work. We do come at a little bit more of a boutique and a premium. A lot of you guys know that um, I've, I've said that for a long time. I think that's where a lot of opportunity is in the industry, whether it's residential or commercial. Um, the guys are fantastic. Uh, we do have some great equipment. I'm a big equipment nut, like a lot of you guys watching. Um, so, like, we were pretty good at some of these key metrics here, but other ones, uh, I, I just hate to admit. I mean, we've never even focused on a mark. And again, I'm glad that some things are reporting back good or above average, or you know, we're seven out of ten, you know, uh, doing pretty good. But it's the other things that I've never considered or never thought about, or we do need to pay attention to that uh, I just didn't want to get bit. I heard somebody say, uh, if you put 50 cents in a pop machine, you don't get half a can. And I don't want to have 50% uh, of my business figured out or 70% of my figured, uh, business figured out. Um, because as we continue to grow and as we continue to scale, if these numbers weren't right from the baseline, imagine the world of hurt we'd be in if we scaled to a million or two million with numbers that were in the red or didn't look good. You know, and um, there's a guy out there, his name is Mike, and he says, you can't shelve your way to a better price. Uh, you know, there's there's all these motivational quips and sayings. And the older you get, the more you realize you got to pay attention to this stuff. Again, you, let me rephrase that. You don't have to. But if you want to stay in business for the long haul and you want to make true profit with your company um, and you... If you've ever said, man, I'm working too hard for too little, or I feel like I'm giving it away, or man, I'm just not making the profit that I deserve. Like folks, I have said all the above and I'm right there with you. Again, um, I, I don't 
want to portray this as some kind of silver bullet in any way, shape, or form. There's a lot of work here that we got to do. I mean, 600 grand is not going to post up on its own. Me and my guys, we're going to be working pretty hard this year. Um, but I just wanted to show, like, this is what we intend to do. This is what we plan to do. Uh, Mark's challenging, actually, behind the scenes for me to grow even more than this. He said, dude, you guys got the capacity to do so much more. And uh, I feel like, you know, him pulling that out of us is going to help us perform and go to the next level. So um, there's a lot of questions, Mark. Um, I know we want to be sensitive to the time. I want to be sensitive to your schedule, too. I don't even know where you start on some of the questions. Um, there's a lot of folks that... You know, we're asking if you guys have a trial. Uh, folks are asking if you have a, the, the budget tools available for free. Um, how much does LMN cost? A lot of the, you know, the probably the more basic questions. Yeah. Um, would you be able to spend just a few minutes? I, it's not a yeah, sales pitch, sure. but, but I'm sure people do want to know some of those pretty obvious uh, questions, you know, and uh, good questions, obviously. Yeah, so the budgeting tool, um, if you take a free trial, the budgeting tool, you can use it completely. And you can download a PDF of your budget and store that on your own computer. So if you decide to just, if you just need to build a budget and you're not ready to invest in software, we're totally cool with you downloading, uh, get the free account, build your budget, download it, and then at least you've got operating numbers for this year. And so we don't limit the number of trials you take. You can take a trial. When it ends, we'll help you extend it. We're good with that. But also, like, if next year you need to come back and do another free budget, we're cool with that. We, we, we don't ever limit that. Now, um, the training and the ongoing training uh, that we offer, you can um, access. We've got training on YouTube. We've got training um, on the website and training here in the software. Um, when you sign up for LMN, you get a, an onboarding specialist and you get an account manager assigned to help you through the process. So until you're a paying customer, we don't invest our team in training you and setting up the whole account. It's a, it's a fairly lengthy process and our, and our team does a lot of the work for you. That is what you get with the paid account when you, uh, when you get started and sign up. Um, so ultimately the pricing is very straightforward. You can just hit the pricing page on the LMN website. It's all right there. We don't, uh, we're very transparent with pricing. There's no, uh, there's no complicated uh, pricing model and there's no contract. So you can always take a look there and you can grab a trial um, right from the website as well. Make sure you put in uh, Brian's code. If you do sign up, um, definitely put Brian's code in. There's some, uh, some extra benefits to using Brian's code. I'll tell you what that benefit is. You get white glove onboarding. So our white glove onboarding package is $4,997. You get that for the regular onboarding price of 997. So you're saving $4,000. You're getting a lot better onboarding package when you use Brian's code. So make sure if you're going to sign up that you use that code because we don't you'll, you'll miss out on a lot of value on that onboarding program. Um, so uh, that said, I'll just move on to estimating, Brian. If uh, if there's no budget specific questions, the, like, I mean that kind of gives you the overview of the software packages. If that helps. Yeah, no, I like that. Um... And again, you guys can go to goelement.com to see the rest and learn more. If you need our link or our code, just shoot me an email or DM. I got you guys. Um, I wanted to, uh, there's a lot here and we don't have so much time, but I would love to see if you want to take a few minutes on an estimate or some of our pricing because, uh, folks, I, I don't have the vernacular. I don't have the vocabulary to describe uh, the epiphany. And we have like just a few estimates out, okay? Like, I have to send so much the next couple of days. Admittedly, like I said, I had a head cold, pink eye, uh, respiratory virus for three and a half weeks. Liz and I have been getting just crushed behind the scenes, and I'm trying to un onboard with LMN. And so you can imagine a lobotomy on a lobotomy. Uh, so we have so many bids to put out here. But I wanted to talk about some of these here because this right here uh, it has just opened up my eyes in terms of how we're bidding and pricing work. And I just... I just feel like we, we've we always been good at the work. We've always had great culture, but I've always struggled with how do I accurately price? How is Troy Clogg pricing? How is Sam Gimble pricing? How is Corey Ballard pricing? Like 
what do these dudes know that I don't know? And are they just smarter than me? Sometimes, you know, admittedly. Um, or do they just have better education or better tools than me? And I've come to find that software is a great equalizer, right? Uh, this right here doesn't matter if you're a $20 million company or you guys are doing a million dollars. When you get access to LMN, for example, obviously this is the, uh, the conversation tonight, this can help take all the guesswork out of what you guys are bidding and pricing and how to do it accurately and profitably. I just, I know it sounds redundant, but folks, like I want you to make money. I want you to make profit. I want you to be able to go on nice vacations with your kids and your family. I, I um, don't want our wives driving sled cars and sled old minivans. I, I really care about this. Like I know it's, some people still don't believe that, but I'm like, dude, I want folks to, to win in this industry. And so uh, I want to win in this industry even more. I, my wife and I, we like nice things. We, uh, you know, I, my wife uh, likes, you know, heat and air conditioning and running water. What a, what a, what a prima donna Mark, you know? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm having fun, but it's like, we really do believe that you guys can make a good living in this industry. I, I remember Caleb Allman even saying he had a buddy of his, when Caleb was going into business for himself doing landscaping and the guy said, so, so when are you going to uh, get a real job? And it always bugged Caleb because he's like, landscaping is a real job and you can make real money. And I don't want it to just be the, the high school push out, you know, um, or the druggie, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about what's going on out there. And you come to the element summit that was in Orlando and, and you know, the, uh, 350 people that were there with Mark's team and all the uh, LMN uh, users there. And it's a big LMN summit, as you guys know, these are, these are, these are high performing individuals and achievers. I, I was, I told Mark, I said, I feel like I'm the brokest guy in the room, you know? So I want you guys to experience that next level of your life and your company as well. And if you're not ready for that, like that is totally fine. Nobody's here again to sell your convention that LMNs, you know, the, the silver bullet. I just want to make this opportunity available for you guys and show you what we're excited about. And frankly, um, back it up as well. You know, we've got a lot of work to do as we plan to grow. So this right here, please pay attention. We probably got a 10 minutes, you know, if you will, we want to be respectful of your guys' time. It's already 8:40, but, and then maybe we'll do a couple questions at the end here, Mark, but, um, take it away as much as you want to show them in 10 minutes or less about, um, our sales and pricing. And again, this came in 15% higher if this is the right quote or the other quote that we sold where we would have worked 111 hours for free, for real. Like it's going to be fired up and I'm, no. at I'm, in a, I'm in a public place. I got to calm down. <laughs> so yeah. I'll show you, uh, I'll show you this estimate and a couple of uh, little um, things from the pricing catalog that we can take some questions for sure. So when you land on an estimate in LMN, you look at a, an overview page that looks like this. You update who the salesperson is and who the estimator is. You update the confidence level so that your sales pipeline metrics, which we'll talk about at another time, we'll go through sales pipeline and all the analytics and dashboards that LMN serves up. We're going to keep it simple tonight, focus on budget and estimating. But ultimately, we'd want to update this confidence level. How confident are you? And this one, Brian, did you say you sold this one? Uh, I think we sold the other one. This is a bid that we have out that I submitted on uh, Wednesday or Thursday. The other All one right. previously is the uh, one that recently got approved. But e either or, I mean, we just bid this one out pricing wise, and um, yeah. it's it's as accurate and ready to rock and roll. Good. So we're going to say it's sixty percent, and then when we're looking at the pipeline, the pipeline is going to tell us what we think we've got uh, in the pipeline to sell, and it's going to factor this one down to sixty percent. And that way we know like roughly what we've sold at the end of the day. So I'm going to click on services and pricing. We've got the project name and address in. This all ports in from the CRM if the customer is already in the system. Or we can just build it right here and it'll add into the CRM. So very easy to use. We can click this to get a map to the site. You can see here that this lead came in from uh, Google search. We want to know that because at the end of the day, we want to see at the end of the year where all the business came from. And then we want to run some uh, basic anal analysis to see how much return we got on any marketing investments. So 
if um, if Brian's paying for Google search ads, at the end of the day, he can look and see if he generated a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars in revenue from that those paid ads. And so, really important little feature that we built into the system so that you can analyze your marketing. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is look at services and pricing. And so, what we're looking at here is Brian's got a template that he can pull in very quickly. So he just clicks templates and those templates pull all of these things in very quickly. So if I go to add a service, when I add a service, I just choose from a, a drop down. In this case, we could say seasonal lawn maintenance. I'm not going to do that because it's already in here. And this item pops in. And then what it's going to do is uh, Brian updates how many visits and it's actually building this component based on the labor and equipment in that crew. And so when I click on seasonal lawn maintenance, the way that this prices the system is it's saying every time Brian goes over there with the crew, it's going to be three labor hours and his billable rate for labor is in here. His cost per hour of labor is in here. So pays his staff really well. And then the government burden is on here. So it's co his cost price is $36 an hour for labor. He's charging at 68. His price per visit is going to be $204 for the crew. He's making a 15% profit and he's got a seasonal price here. And he knows that he's 15% profit. For the maintenance crew package, that's the equipment. And again, Brian's not giving the equipment away. He can't afford new equipment and not charge for it. Otherwise, he'd just be taking all his profit every year and buying equipment with it. This way here, he's actually charging the customer while the equipment's there. They're paying their portion of the equipment. In this case, Brian's charging um, 48 bucks per um, visit for the equipment. And so they're paying for that as well. So for seasonal lawn maintenance, this is the breakdown. Now, if we move on and we look at as other components, for every component, he's doing the same thing. So weeding the landscape beds, they're gonna do that for an hour. They're gonna have a price per visit now instead of a seasonal price perhaps. And it's gonna include the crew truck and the weed killer. So anytime they go to the site and do that work, they can charge per hour or per visit. And so when you build the estimate up this way, you can present it in a number of ways. And we can even hide things. And so you can see here, Brian has got mulch install, spring and in flower installation, fall installation, irrigation startup and irrigation shutdown um, hidden right now. That's just a quick uh, toggle of the switch. And then when he presents the price, he can look at it uh, one way or the other. Also from within the estimating dashboard, he can open up and measure the site. Now this, this can really help you avoid um, having to measure turf you know, manually. So we can just go ahead and measure the site. It's gonna bring up the, the location uh, that, we're, that we're going to look at and we can you know, measure lawn areas. We can do whatever we want very quickly. We can start to create measurements for work areas. And hey Mark, not, we, not, not to interrupt you, for, for all of my local buddies listening in, uh, you, we did change some of these addresses, so don't be too sneaky here. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, I got a bunch, bunch of buddies. They're like, I can't believe you're showing your screen and doing all this, Mark. And I said, we'll change one or two things. Relax. But, um, <laughs> you know, and, and you guys know right where I live. I got 10 buddies on the live stream right now texting me like, dude, don't show your screen. I'm like, we're doing it. We're doing all of it. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so again, we could just do all of our measurements from, from here rather than taking the wheel out on site. So we can measure up jobs and uh, create our square footages uh, very quickly. Now, when we get into the system at any point in time, we can override profits. So what you're seeing here is we built out all the components of the estimate. Again, this just takes a few minutes because ultimately it's a template. So Brian builds this once, and now every time he goes to price a similar job, he just uses a template. He updates the hours um, needed for each of these specific tasks very quickly. And 
he has his price. Not much work. You'd price a job this size in uh, minutes, really. Um, and so ultimately, what we want to look at once we built the estimate is we want to understand how we're going to then use all this information. So in Brian's case, he's pitching this as a seven payment contract. He's going to, um, he can go into client notes. And because we build these once and then they're always here, when you put your estimate notes and your standard terminology for mulching and spring cleanups, how you explain these things, you can just go ahead and click add the terms and conditions and it's gonna push that into this estimate. So again, you build things once and then you just kind of click and add what you want to the estimate. Same with crew notes, maybe you wanna put um, explanations or standard directions that go to the crew. You can add those as well. But the most important thing with LMN is once Brian's built this estimate, he needs to analyze it before he decides to give it to a customer. Now, this is a major component of the operating system. We don't want you to ever build a quote without analyzing it. So that means actually looking at the quote and knowing how much uh, revenue per hour it's going to generate in comparison with the budget. And that tells us that if our crew is out producing all year at this rate, we're going to meet the plan or we're not. And so the, the this estimate revenue per hour is a little bit lower than the budget revenue per hour. And so that could be concern for most companies. Now, I'll say that this one is okay. And the reason it's okay, that it's just slightly under is because Brian also does install work. And we know that this estimate doesn't have a lot of materials on it. Some of his other estimates are going to probably be as high as $150 or $160 per hour, like when he's doing mulching or when he's doing some work that involves some other materials. So in this case, it's okay that it's a little under. Um, we just don't want it, this number to be grossly under. And there's an over or under throughout the year, but we want to understand where this one sits. Now, the cost ratios are really important. The labor here is 33%, the equipment's 10, materials are 6.2, subs are 13.4, the overhead's 23, and the profit's 13.8. So the gross profit on this estimate is 36.8, which is a little on the low side, but not dangerously low. And the net profit's nice and healthy at 13.8%. So as I look at this analysis, I'm gonna say, this isn't an incredibly great job, but it's not a bad job. Um, and so I'd go ahead and, and approve this estimate, knowing that if I do this work, it's going to be profitable. It's not going to be um, exceeding my revenue per hour plan, but it's not so far off that it's going to hurt me either. And so I would go ahead and do this. And this is like a really important component when estimating. But most people don't know this information when they put quotes out. This key information, this cost summary tells you whether or not this is a good bid. And so it's 11,600 in work. The cost to perform the work is 7,350. The gross profit is 4,266. And this is the mistake a lot of people make. They stop there and say, well, I'm making lots of money. And the reality is, is you're not. You still have to pay overhead, which is Brian's wages, the truck, the rent, all those other expenses we looked at earlier. And so the break even on this job is 10,000. And so the net profit on a job like this is only $1,600. And so you gotta do a lot of these in a year to be really profitable. And so now when Brian shows up and this person says, well, you know, I've got another price for 9,000. If he doesn't know this, he might jump at it and say, well, okay, I'll do it for nine too. But the reality is, is then you're giving it away. Worse yet, you're paying them to go and cut their grass every week. Like what could be worse? Um, can I, can yeah, I jump ahead. in on that? Yeah, I, yeah. that? That's the part that's blowing my mind. And we just have a few of these under our belt. I've got another 30 to send out admittedly over the next couple of days and a bunch of renewals. But um, I, I love that point because so many other folks have said that, you know, even on podcasts, like, you know, it's name your price lawn care sometimes out there, whether it's residential or commercial. And people say, well, how do you, have confidence in submitting your work and 
it's literally by knowing your numbers. And when people say know your numbers, this is what knowing your numbers means. You can't give away the farm. You know, this other commercial site uh, previously that I keep referring back to, we would have gave it away if I would have bid it on the same contract that I bid uh, just 18 months ago. And I have the uh, pen and paper version that I sent out. Once I punched into LMN, it gave me accurate pricing. And it was, like I said, 15% higher in pricing and almost 15% higher in profit. But the point is, I maybe would have fudged that number up another 5%, 6%. I don't know. Inflation, they say, is 3.5%. Three, three so maybe we'll raise our prices 3.5% this year. No. Based on my actual operating budget, I can feel confident in how I'm bidding. And again, folks, I'm like a half dozen uh, quotes and bids into this process. I, I hope to do this uh, same conversation, you know, Mark, uh, as we go through this multiple times a year. And a year from now, really catch our stride and really catch a cadence. But again, I, I just want to go back to like, it's no more guessing with how we're bidding and pricing our work. And, and admittedly, the reason that number is a little low is because we didn't have the mulch. The gentleman didn't want to renew that. Uh, and it is in a backyard of our commercial sites on the beaten path. So I'm hoping to pick up a little bit of productivity and efficiency on that site. But also the gentleman gave me the price of the other company last year and they were $900 cheaper. And I emailed it to him and I said, hey, that company must have a better opportunity to uh, spread over their overhead costs being a larger company. And I know they do 10, 20 million. Um, but I said, for us being a small business, this is just where our price needs to be. We hope to earn it. Hope to have that high touch. Hey, this is my cell phone. Call me if you have a problem. So it's not a, a horrible site. It's not a, a home run site, but you know, it's a double and we'll take that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's a good job at the end of the day, just knowing where you stand. And now you're going to get some enhancement sales there, right? That guy yes. did, didn't yeah. sign up for mulch. He's going to want mulch once spring hits. You're yep. going to go out there. You're probably going to make a thousand bucks the day you go mulching. That makes it a much better contract. And like, it's the enhancements where the opportunity is. And I think it's really important for people to understand just how big the opportunity is on enhancement sales. And that's hopefully something you and I'll talk about a little bit more on some of your link nights and, and some of these yeah. YouTube videos, because enhancements are where the super profit really kicks in. I think you guys saw on the, uh, on the budget, budget, we really showed a big growth in enhancements because that's going to be uh, the area of focus because it's high profit, much higher margin, much higher revenue per hour. It allows you to pay your staff more money and, and really sell your customers more because usually that's what they want anyway, right? At the end of the day, they want their property looking amazing. And yep. when you've got the capacity and the focus on selling enhancements, they, uh, they buy. That's the reality. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. A lot of folks um, have uh, some hesitancy potentially upgrading or graduating to LMN because they have some reservation about uh, LMN being great for a service business. Well, you guys just saw our whole budget and everything we were doing with uh, you know maintenance and snow. We're excited about growing into more landscaping, as you guys can imagine. So, <coughs> excuse me, for all of you guys that are landscaping and hardscaping, you can apply those same templates that you've already built out uh, and, and continue to you know use that for your business. Uh, and I think that's where really LMN definitely shines as well, the job costing and, and so much more. So um, it's it's just, it's refreshing. It's exciting. There's no more guessing. Uh, we've had a lot to learn still, don't get me wrong. And we got a lot of work to do. I was, one of my guys is texting me right now. He's like, dude, let's get it this year. And he said, let's do an accountability. This is this is how ambitious my guys are. And Mark, you said this, it's, you said, an organization doesn't just grow because the leader wants to. And the organization grows because your staff want to grow and it challenges you to become a better leader well go figure my guys uh because they're crazy ryan he's texting me saying hey man are we going to do a year over year and show uh, not an if but when our forecasts are actually hit and i'm like dude please stop putting me on blast on the internet because now we actually have to hit all this stuff that we're talking about if not again we're just gonna be full of it right so it's like here we go we're excited about growing excited about performing and uh putting our money where our mouth is so Thanks, Ryan, for the text. I appreciate that. I'm sure Mark uh, sent you 20 bucks to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like like I said, everybody's an entrepreneur. And the more transparent you are as a business owner, the more that your staff can actually exercise their entrepreneurial spirit. And like, that's it right there. Like, he's clearly an entrepreneur at heart. Like, like oh, I yeah. said, everybody is. And when you're transparent and you create a, a system 
that other people can kind of be a part of and unlock their true potential. It just, you, then you're surrounded by teammates and that makes a big difference because running a business uh, in a silo and hiding everything, it, it's no fun. It's, uh, it's a lot of stress and usually you're hiding the worst. You're not hiding something that's going better than expected. And the, the truth is, is owners often end up feeling really lonely because they're actually hiding the bad truth, the fact that the business isn't really as profitable as everybody thinks. And so they don't really get the buy-in from the employees to help them actually become more efficient and unlock the potential of the business so that everybody can earn more. And I think like when you can operate as transparently as we, we are tonight with you showing your numbers like this, your team understands and then they really care and they want to help. And I know you've got a great team. You've, you've shared that many times, but I think you'll see a different level, a different spring in their step with this level of transparency. I know, uh, I know it makes all the difference. Well, uh, if, if not the team and the guy is definitely the wife, she says uh, we work too hard to make uh, too little and uh, little's relative, but I said, hey, if we bring home the uh, the cheese or you know bring home the mustard, then hopefully uh, she'll be just as equally excited and uh, as excited to continue to grow the company. And Liz is great, but you guys know what I'm saying, having some fun there. So maybe uh, we don't have to uh, make a picture uh, appeal to you guys listening in, but uh, let me ask the wives out there if you guys are making the amount of money that they believe that we deserve. And uh, they'll be a little bit more honest than maybe some of us will uh, on this live stream, if you know what I'm saying. So just having some fun there, but let's all win. Let's all grow together. Uh, I'm sure uh, I don't, I don't want to uh, be an expensive first date here, but I know, Mark, you're continuously offering uh, your time and, and energy to the community. If we can ever get a chance to have you back on and explore other elements of this, we'd love to have you. So um, anything that you want to leave, I'll give you the uh, the final, uh, you know, uh, conversation here or any other points. Let me let me just say this really quick, folks. There's a lot of opportunities out there for you to sign up with other software. I will just tell you, I'm not here to be anybody's guinea pig. I'm not here to uh, guess. I'm not here to work with somebody else who's guessing. I will just tell you, uh, other softwares might have some shiny bells or whistles or um, have some hype. I will just tell you, none of them come with Mark Bradley and 30 to 40 years of experience doing this. So just, I say, I said this recently on a podcast. Please don't treat your software and your CRM and that operating system flippantly. This isn't something to ask your buddy, hey, what are you doing? And then switch 12 months later, then switch another 12 months later. You'll never get in a rhythm. You'll never get a cadence. You'll never get any confidence about what you're doing. So I know it can seem like a lot and it is a lot. But once you have it mastered and that's underneath your belt, if you will, and now you can just rinse and repeat, that's really going to give you the, the best opportunity uh, to grow and to maximize the future of your company. So please don't chase bells and whistles. Please uh, don't chase experiments. Um, no shade on anybody out there, of course. Uh, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. I don't have time to. And I don't believe a lot of you guys uh, do as well. You know, we have families. We have obligations. Uh, for me per uh, personally, I really value what Mark's done, is doing, and is going to be doing. So that's just my... Um, my request, my plea to you guys that out there that are looking to uh, maybe, you know, graduate to a software, uh, give Element a, a fair shake. I think it'll be the best decision for you. So, Mark, that's my last two cents. I just want to say thanks again for jumping on here. Anything you want to leave these guys? And uh, that's all I got, brother. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. No, I, I, not much to add. I mean, you can always hit me up directly. You can email me, uh, just mark at goelement.com. Pretty simple. Just mark with a K at goelement.com. You can find me on Instagram, it's just Mark Bradley 360 or LinkedIn. Just search up Mark Bradley from LMN Software and you'll find me. And uh, reach out direct anytime. I'll hook you up with uh, somebody from my team. I chat with people every day, all day. So uh, feel free to reach out. We'll find a way to help you out and, uh, and bring you into our community. We really see it as a community. We really... Um, really, really aim to help educate you, your employees, and really unlock the true potential for you and your business using the operating system that we have. There you go. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much for the time. Uh, two hours. Please don't send me the invoice. I don't think I can afford your time. Uh, so just having fun. But uh, maybe if we budget it correctly for it, we could. But that's about <laughs>
that's a horrible joke. But in which way, uh, guys, we'll sign off here. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have questions, shoot me an email as well. Uh, shoot me a message on Instagram. Always here for you guys. And uh, you guys have a good night. And we'll catch up with you guys here on the next video and uh, the next podcast. All right. See you guys. Bye.